Chapter 25, verses 1 through 27. Chapter 25, Burkett Notes. St. Paul's trial before the Roman governor, Felix, was recorded at large in the foregoing chapter. In this we find him brought upon his trial before Festus, who succeeded Felix in the administration of the government. And although Festus could find the apostle guilty of no misdemeanor, yet he had neither the courage nor honesty to set him at liberty, but sends him bound from Caesarea to Rome, as St. Luke relates in this and the following chapters. Verses 1-5 through five. Now when Festus was come into the province, after three days he ascended from Caesarea to Jerusalem. Then the high priest and the chief priest of the Jews informed him against Paul, and besought him, and desired favor against him, that he would send him to Jerusalem, laying wait in the way to kill him. But Festus answered that Paul should be kept at Caesarea, and that he himself would depart shortly thither. Let them, therefore, said he, which among you are able, go down with me and accuse this man, if there be any wickedness in him. Burkett notes, St. Luke here informs us that Festus, being come to the government and going up to Jerusalem, the high priests and rulers of the Jews quickly began to inform him against Paul, and besought him that he would send for him to Jerusalem, resolving to lay some villains by the way to kill him as he came. But the divine providence so overruled the matter that Festus would not consent to it, but ordered his accusers to come to Caesarea and plead him there. Here note, one, how restless is the rage and unwearied the malice and enmity which the persecutors of the truth have against the professors and preachers of it. The high priest and the chief of the Sanhedrin, or ecclesiastical court, continue their murderous designs against the innocent apostle, and are sorry they could not get a heathen governor as cruel as themselves to join with them. Heathens have sometimes blushed at the mention of those crimes which the professors of religion have committed without either shame or remorse. Note, too, how deplorably corrupt and degenerate the Jewish church at this time was. Lord, what priests and church governors were here, who call it a favor to have an opportunity granted to them to murder an innocent man in cold blood, contrary to the law of nature and of nations. But behold the justice of God upon them. They were now given up to a reprobate sense, and are hurried headlong by a diabolical spirit, a little before their final destruction. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who killed the prophets, and stoned them that were sent unto thee. Note 3. What an overruling providence was here seen, in that Festus, by no flatteries nor persuasions, would be prevailed with to remove the apostle from Caesarea to Jerusalem. This broke the high priest's measures, who designed to have him killed by the way. No, saith Festus, the prisoner shall not come to you, but you shall go to him. This was a marvelous providence for the apostle's preservation. Oh, how easy it is for the most wise God to baffle and blast the most cunning contrivances of the devil, to befool the enemies of his church and people by making the counsels of the wicked to be of no effect. God looks and laughs at all the plots of wicked men against the righteous. Frustration and disappointment attend all their designs, and perdition and destruction doth await their persons. Psalm 2, 5 He that sitteth in heaven laugheth them to scorn. The Lord has them in derision. Verses 6 through 8 And when he had tarried among them more than ten days, he went down unto Caesarea, and the next day, sitting on the judgment seat, commanded Paul to be brought. And when he was come, the Jews which came down from Jerusalem stood round about, and laid many and grievous complaints against Paul, which they could not prove, while he answered for himself, neither against the law of the Jews, neither against the temple, nor yet against Caesar, have I offended anything at all. Burkett notes, observe here, one, the equity and justice of Festus, a heathen judge, in his proceedings at Paul's trial. He will have the high priest and elders that accuse him speak to his face. He will have the prisoner brought forth. He will have the matter examined by and before himself. When the malicious bring the innocent upon their trial, God will provide a judge for their turn. Observe, too, the indictment or charge which the Jews brought in against the apostle, that he had offended against the law, profaned the temple, and raised sedition against the Roman government. 
Here we find the devil at his own trade, namely stirring up the rage and malice of the world against the saints of God, under a pretense of their being enemies to the state and subverters of civil government. Observe three, that to be loaded with calumnies and reproaches has been the common lot and constant portion of the friends and servants of Christ from the first beginning of Christianity. The Jews laid many and grievous things against Paul, which they could not prove. Reproach has been the reward of religion and righteousness. But St. Paul easily wipes off the several reproaches cast upon him, affirming himself to have always been a religious observer of the law, that he went into the temple upon a religious account, and that he never taught nor practiced any rebellion against Caesar. The servants of Christ are happy in their own innocency, and their adversaries render themselves odious by belying them and laying that to their charge which everyone can disprove. Verses 9 through 12. But Festus, willing to do the Jews a pleasure, answered Paul and said, Wilt thou go up to Jerusalem and there be judged of these things before me? Then said Paul, I stand at Caesar's judgment seat where I ought to be judged. To the Jews I have done no wrong, as thou very well knowest. For if I be an offender, or have committed anything worthy of death, I refuse not to die. But if there be none of these things, whereof these accuse me, no man may deliver me unto them. I appeal unto Caesar. Then Festus, when he had conferred with the council, answered, Hast thou appealed unto Caesar? Unto Caesar thou shalt go. Burkett notes, Observe here, How Festus, being willing to gratify the Jews, asked St. Paul if he would go to Jerusalem and be tried there in the Jewish court about those matters. The apostle replied that he was his proper judge, under the Roman emperor, and not the Jews, and that being a Roman, he might claim the privilege of a Roman, which accordingly he did by appealing unto Caesar. Festus, hearing that, not only admitted his appeal, but was glad of it, to get rid of him without peril on the one hand, or ill will on the other. Here we may remark, one, that carnal politicians do not so much consider what is just and righteous in its own nature as what is of use and advantage to themselves, be it right or wrong. The apostle had cleared himself from all slanderous accusations, and yet Festus, willing to do the Jews a pleasure, would not set him at liberty. It is too often the practice of corrupt judges that they may please the people, to deliver up truth to be injuriously crucified, considering more their own interest than the prisoner's innocency. Note, too, how the apostle appeals from Jerusalem to Rome, from his own countrymen to heathens, from the high priest to the emperor Nero, expecting to find more justice at the hands of infidels than from the Jewish Sanhedrin. And to this the apostle was in some sort divinely admonished by Christ himself to make his appeal. Acts 23.11. Be of good cheer, Paul. Thou shalt bear witness to me at Rome. Doubtless this was a mighty support and strong consolation to him to know that he had appealed and desired to go to Rome, where God had appointed to have him go. Verses 13-21. through 21. And after certain days, King Agrippa and Bernice came into Caesarea to salute Festus. And when they had been there many days, Festus declared Paul's cause unto the king, saying, There is a certain man left in bonds by Felix, about whom, when I was at Jerusalem, the chief priests and the elders of the Jews informed me, desiring to have knowledge against him. To whom I answered, It is not the manner of the Romans to deliver any man to die before that he which is accused have the accusers face to face, and have license to answer for himself concerning the crime laid against him. Therefore, when they were come hither without any delay, on the morrow, I sat on the judgment seat and commanded the man to be brought forth, against whom, when the accusers stood up, they brought none accusations of such things as I supposed, but had certain questions against him of their own superstition, and of one Jesus, which was dead, whom Paul affirmed to be alive. And because I doubted of such manner of questions, I asked him whether he'd go to Jerusalem and there be judged of these matters. But when Paul had appealed to be reserved unto the hearing of Augustus, I commanded him to be kept till I might send him to Caesar. Burkett notes, observe here, 
One, how God will not be wanting to his servants in their greatest straits and sufferings, but will providentially dispose of all matters in order to their deliverance, when it may most conduce to his own glory and their good. Thus here, King Agrippa comes in to congratulate Festus. Festus declares the cause of God's oppressed servant to the king, and God makes use of both Festus and Agrippa to screen the apostle from the violence of his enemies. In the mount will the Lord be seen. The people's extremities are the season of his succor. Observe, too, how the very light of nature in and among the heathens condemns it as an act of manifest and notorious injustice in a judge to pass sentence upon a person unheard and unallowed to make his defense. This baseness was below the Roman gallantry, while pagans. Festus demands the accusers and the accused to appear face to face, and yet such a diabolical spirit of malice had so blinded the Jews that contrary to the law of nature and the law of all nations, they would have had Paul here condemned without knowing the cause and hearing his defense. Observe 3. What base and vile, what low and undervaluing thoughts and apprehensions have carnal men of the high and holy things of God. Festus here calls the religion and worship, which was of God's own institution, most profanely and contemptuously by the name of superstition. They had certain questions against him of their own superstition. And how slightingly does he also speak of our glorified Redeemer, styling him one Jesus. But no wonder that the dunghill cocks of the world know not the worth of the pearl of great price. Verses 22 through 27. Then Agrippa said unto Hephaestus, I would also hear the man myself. Tomorrow, he said, thou shalt hear him. And on the morrow, when Agrippa was come, and Bernice, with great pomp, and was entered into the place of hearing with the chief captains and principal men of the city, at Festus's command, Paul was brought forth. And Festus said, King Agrippa and all men which are here present with us, ye see this man, about whom all the multitude of the Jews have dealt with me, both at Jerusalem and also here, crying that he ought not to live any longer. But when I found that he had committed nothing worthy of death, and that he himself has appealed to Augustus, I have determined to send him, of whom I have no certain thing to write unto my Lord. Wherefore I have brought him forth before you, and especially before thee, O King Agrippa, that after examination had, I might have somewhat to write. For it seemeth to me unreasonable to send a prisoner, and not withal to signify the crimes laid against him. Burkett notes, observe here, one, King Agrippa's curiosity to see and hear St. Paul. He was born and bred up amongst the Jews, and probably understood something of the Christian religion, and possibly had heard much of Paul, and therefore desired to see him, as Herod desired to see Christ and to hear John the Baptist, only to gratify his curiosity, not to be advantaged by his ministry. Observe, too, how contemptuously the Holy Ghost speaks of all the pomp, retinue, and state which Festus, Agrippa, and Bernice appeared in at the time and place of hearing. He calls it fancy, so the original word signifies, intimating that all the pomp, gaiety, and glory of the world is nothing but fancy, a dream and a shadow, having no real existence, but being in imagination only. Observe 3. The truth and innocency shall shine forth the more splendidly by the greater opposition that is raised against them. The more malicious the Jews were in accusing Paul, the more did his innocency appear, and the more was he acquitted and discharged by his judges. Thus we see the providence of God wrought all matters for St. Paul's justification and for the Jews' reprehension. Festus had nothing to write to Caesar, no crime to inform him of against the apostle. Thence learn that although God sometimes permits his servants to be laden with slanders and reproaches, yet he will find a time to clear their innocency and cause their very judges, if not their accusers, to proclaim them guiltless. I find, saith Festus, that he has committed nothing worthy of death. It is no small mercy to have our innocency vindicated, for God to clear up our righteousness as the light, and our just dealings as the noonday, and to free our reputation from those blemishes which the uncharitable suspicions or rash censures of men have cast upon us. There is no spot so unbeautiful as that upon our credit, saving only a spot upon our consciences. 
God made the apostles' enemies here do him right, and his name was clothed with honor in the estimation of his very adversaries.